Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Nucci. Um, I graduated 2014 from the University of Washington with a degree in civil and environmental engineering. And I'd like to repeat, like everybody else said, I'm honored I'm to be here with all you. Fascinating projects. Um, I'd like to see what we all do with it. Okay, so I hope it comes as no surprise that the world is facing an energy crisis, both in pollution and in just like finding the energy we need. It's kind of come from two sources. Um, the 20th century alone saw a 20 times increase in the use of fossil fuels, which is unprecedented, um, and slated to continue another 50% increase by 2040. Um, so, but the good news is that renewable energies like solar and wind are the fastest growing sector of our energy matrix at 2.5% a year. So with the interest moving that way, gov various governments giving out um, grants and support in that kind of research, there's a lot of opportunities growing for various other energy methods. And like I said, it focuses on tidal and wave energy. Um, so why Santiago, which I'm sure this question I'll get anyway, is a bunch of perfect storm of different opportunities and events. Um, one, the Merit, which is a marine energy research and innovation center. Started two years ago, it's an eight-year project funded at some $20 million, focusing on looking into um, increasing knowledge and technology, hydrokinetic technology in energy production. Um, so I'm going to be working tightly with them. I need to meet up with them. Um, they're also integrated with the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, who is uh, my affiliated university. I'm going to be taking auditing classes there and working with uh, Chris, Professor Escuriaza, who is here. Um, so. I want to extend a huge thank you for all the help you sent my way. And um, he worked closely with my professor back at UW, so there's an affiliation there, um, doing research at, again, a little bit later, but check out channel is right here. Um, large flows there. There's a project that Merrick and the university here and my home university, Washington, are all working together on putting turbines there. Um, so it'll be really exciting to get to be this uh, middleman emissary between these two universities. Um, as there's also a full writer from Chile studying there, so we can all share information and knowledge. Uh, Chile in general is a very fascinating location for marine energy. Um, as you can tell, it's got a lot of coastline. Um, and as you go further south into like uh, the stronger winds of the southern Pacific and all those little like fjords and channels, there's a lot of energy density, both for tidal and um, wave energy, to be harvested. So. Uh, I'd like to go into a little bit of my background, how I got here. Um, my family, uh, I was raised as a commercial fisherman. There's a picture of a boat I spent probably 10 summers of my life fishing on up in Alaska. So um, not only did we start fishing in Puget Sound, but then I would fish in Alaska a lot of my summers, um, pay for my college. I've got a strong connection to the ocean, um, and that really gave me a love and respect for the power that is there. And so it was um, Professor Thompson, I'll say a big thank you to. Um, his class when I realized that there was actually some opportunity to connect my background in with the ocean to science and to progress and to this technology that I really think can make huge leaps and bounds for the energy um, that we use. So um, I was excited to do that and it was Professor Thompson that helped me get an opportunity working at this startup here. It's called Ocilla Power Incorporated. I think that was 2013 to 14. You can see Seattle in the background and uh, actually I'm that little one right there. <laughs> but uh, we did a test launch in Lake Washington, and so that's a big 40 ton, I think, buoy that would gather energy just from floating along in the ocean. Um, and so it was a very fascinating year and a half getting to see the startup environment and just all the interest and money that's there looking for these new methods. Um, after moving on and graduating from there, I worked at a different company called RPS, an oceanography firm in Seattle. Uh, I think that's an oil platform, but that's the buoy that I spent a lot of time working on. We actually had like six of those. Um, I think four floating up in Alaska, so I spent a lot of time deploying oceanographic and meteorological instruments to gather different data, um, both in Alaska and British Columbia, and I just got to spend time in both those companies working on electronics and data gathering and analysis. So it really led me to a really fascinating step-by-step -step process to be here now, um, an inter interdisciplinary team researching oceanographic. Um, I moved. Okay, so this is Checkout Channel, like I pointed out. Um, you can see some similarities between Checkout Channel and Puget Sound, which is where I come from. Um, I have a small inlet here, lots of water behind it, gives it a huge flow. There's like an eight knot current there, and that's the proposed test site 
for the turbines here. There's another project, um, don't remember if they put in the water here, but right here in Admiralty Inlet, again at the narrow point for the whole Puget Sound. Um, and so there's huge connections there between like similar oceanographic um, data, and so that's why you get to work together. Um, so I think the most clear thing to be gained here is hopefully diversifying our energy portfolio and getting away from fossil fuels. But what I want to focus on and find really interesting is creating the energy independence for smaller communities, especially that island, I think it's Chiloe, um, right there by um, Checkout Channel, has a lot of smaller communities. And most of them are dependent on, I feel like in Chile is 75% fossil fuel for its energy use. Um, so they're dependent on frequent deliveries by barge to run diesel generators. They're loud, noisy, and pollutant. And so the opportunity for these communities to be energy independent by this buoy floating off in the harbor, this thing you don't even see under the water, is just like fascinating, and I think you can do a lot for them. Um, there's other, probably more economically advantageous opportunities too, um, different places that need energy and have a lot of water nearby. Um, so more specifically, what I will be doing, um, working with Professor Escuriaga, is a 3D print, a smaller version of turbines that um, some look like that, there's multiple designs, Make smaller version, put it in a flume and run water over it, and just look at the energy characteristics of like what goes in, what goes out, and try to optimize that system. I don't have a very uh, well-developed methodology right now because I'm still very much getting into it, and I know there's a lot of research projects going on at the university, um, and so I want to get caught up to date and see what the best way I can like help out. And, um, don't know if I'm just don't know how long it's going to take. So I'm excited to get started next week. Um, the other focus of my research is the culture integration, because you can have the best technology in the world, but if the community doesn't want it or doesn't know about it or understand it, it's not going to help. Um, and so I was going to first of all use my connection to fishing to interview Chilean fishermen in that area and see what, if they know this technology, what they think of it, um, whether they are worried about pollution from fossil fuels or whether they're afraid of the nets catching the turbines or just like, their understanding of how this could influence their lives. Um, and again, very exciting to hopefully get away from fossil fuels because even like 2014 there was a 5,800 gallon spill here in Chile um, a lot and so like if they don't already know about it maybe help them realize that like that spill could destroy their fishery indefinitely and just try and get public see if the public support is there um, yeah so there'll be a cultural and policy based interview process I want to go through as well um, and I'll go back to questions yeah. You mentioned that um, there's a possibility that turbines could disrupt the net. I really something. don't think so. It's but just like I was just curious if there, because I know that um, it's been controversial to have turbines in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Well, turbines anywhere really, but that they are disruptive of bird flight patterns and other things. But what what is this, the parallels between that and then underwater? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely going to be a focus. I wrote in my presentation with a focus on blue whales because there's a big migration of them in that same area of Patagonia. So we're going to make sure it doesn't affect them, and not even that it's not going to like you know injure them, but also that the noise of it spinning is going to scare them away. Like there's definitely that's a big focus. Um, I think I actually forgot to say it in my first slide, but I want to focus on the environmental impact and make sure it's not just like cool. We got we can get plenty of energy, but then like now there's no more fish here. So. Um, that's definitely going to be a focus. And I haven't looked into exactly, that's why I want to go gather data down there of like fish migration patterns, how they all act. But um, I did a similar research project back in college about renewables. And I was looking up avian mortality from, I think you were mentioning windmills, right? Like people don't like the noise and it kills birds. And it was on the, this list of avian mortality. Um, the number, it was a number three killer was windmills. And it was like three orders of magnitudes less than like, uh, glass, like window panes, they just fly into. And then, like, ten times more than that was bird, uh, cats. And so it's like, yeah, people complain about, like, windows killing uh, birds, but it's like, I don't know, four is magnitudes less than just cats do. So sometimes it's, like, not that important. I can, I can compliment about that because that's a very, very good question. What, one of the things that we are doing, in fact, is looking into that in the environmental aspect, of that's what Eric will be working on. Um, we are working with a marine mammal specialist from the uh, University of Australia mm -hmm. uh, because the Chacao Channel has the highest concentration of blue whales in the world. Um, so acoustics will be also one of the issues. 
also you can change the flow patterns in the area and you know concentrate the the contaminants in some areas that were not uh, um, and uh, there are different impacts depending on the size of the turbines and how many turbines you put so the turbines he showed uh, Eric showed had 16 meter diameter which are huge turbines supposedly to be connected to you know uh, as part of the energy portfolio on the other hand when you have um, in small communities with the small turbines, the, the environmental influence is going to be totally different. So that's our open questions that we're actually going to address as part of America. It's, it's a lot of fun. I was wondering if um, there's been any, because like I know that the tides in Chile are also like rather dramatic, um, sort of going like from like, the other side of the island archipelago, or like or like you know, it's like a certain side. Chile? Well, it, the, the turbine is due to the, yeah, oh, probably to the you can answer, it's due, due to the ties, in fact. Oh, I see, okay, I thought it was due to the And, and I, I, I remember another, I remember another uh, environmental impact. As you said, in that area, there is a huge tidal difference between, you know, the, the high tide and the ebb. Um, in some areas, seven meters. And all that, you probably know better, this intertidal area. It's very rich in terms of the ecosystems. Okay? So if you extract energy from the tides somewhere else, then we might have a change also in this uh, patterns that can also affect this intertidal area. Yeah. Those are all the questions that we will have to address before right. <laughs> connecting anything to the grid. Mm -hmm. Hopefully for the next presentation we have some answers. Yeah. So you, you're going to have to have all those questions answered. <laughs> exactly, <the> nine months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and speaking of connecting to the grid, I know you know there there is a renewable resource in um, in Patagonia that's trying to be used, which is the rivers. Um, and uh, one of the big complaints about that isn't just blocking up the rivers, but the, the towers, the, the energy transport. Um, how does energy transport work with, or do, do you have kind of a sense of how that energy will trans be transported to the grid? Um, I don't specifically, it's not like the focus for the energy transport. Like we have the technology, it'll probably be cabled. But that's why I think that the smaller generation smaller point generators are more fascinating because then it's like a lot less um, loss in the distance and in the money yeah. um, in putting these like small ones rather than like having one big power plant at Chacal that powers like all of like you know two provinces of Chile that's gonna yeah have a lot of towers going everywhere but if we can develop smaller ones that create the energy need for smaller communities it cuts out a lot of that more ecological ecological damage from power distribution and that, I mean, isn't a lot of the economic impulse for more energy development from, you know, big energy consumers that are far away? I mean, because the local energy needs of Patagonia, you know, aren't very high. Um, That's why you got, like, the, yeah, try and make it affordable. Um, and yeah, it is going to be funded by the people with money, so it's going to be bigger projects. I'm hoping it, like, hope it trickles down, I guess is what I'm saying. Eric, and do you require uh, authorization from the Navy to deploy the... Do you if, know that? Yeah, it would, but I haven't gone that far yet. Okay. <laughs> could be yeah. not planning to just throw things in the ocean. Yeah, uh, two things. Well, legislation is something that is not really solved in Chile, but <coughs> and, uh, and in many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, to use the bottom of the ocean, you have, you have to ask the Queen. <laughs> so, really? No, really. really. And here, you know, you have to, now there's people in Merrick working on the concessions and investigate. This is not the same as, you know, salmon farms or, um, so there's still a lot, to, a lot to do in terms of, you know, uh, legislation regarding these issues. And also the social aspects, and uh, remind me later to put you in contact with Professor Stefan Gelsich, also who's working in Merrick. Uh, he's from biology, but he's doing research on the social aspects of marine energy asking the fishermen how yeah. much they value the energy and uh, we can talk to him and uh, he has these signs and questionnaires and he's also, he's been in the field already talking to some people trying to see how, you know, yeah. what we don't want to do is to, you know, try to yeah, encourage the installation of the state without, you know, involving a lot of communities and yeah, that would be crazy. So. I, I wonder how it's like similar uh, ocean conditions are here in Chile to, like, say, Europe. 
Because uh, it's my understanding that they have a lot of success with tidal and wave energy in like the um, Ireland, I think. Um, the North Sea, there's quite a few. Yeah. So like, I wonder if like it's similar enough where you can use a lot of how they're doing. There. You can use I the same science. There is definitely similarities, but every single location is very different. And like, I don't actually know the similarities. Like, what, how similar Puget Sound and Chicago are. I think it's more than most, but it's still like you still gotta have a lot of data to know exactly how it affects it, both before and after, and like throughout basically a whole year. Um, so I don't know if similar to the North Sea. I would assume less because mm -hmm. it's fairly open on both sides up there. It's like near the North Pole, so it's got like big energy and big exchanges, but it's not as constricted as like Chacao okay. or Admiralty Inlet or like Bay of Fundy or something. Um, so you can use the same principles, but you still need to gather a ton of data to validate modeling and such.